Welcome again, everybody. Um, I want to uh, remind everybody uh, that when we're talking about these conversations um, and we're looking at what's going on with the session, we really wanna be sure to stay tuned to the hashtag TXLEGE uh, for today's conversations and um, throughout the session. So be sure to, to check that out on all the social media platforms. Um, I do wanna welcome everybody to our second Under the Dome session. Uh, we're so excited to have Representative Rosenthal here today. Um, I do want to thank our sponsors um, for this series. They are HNTB, EHRA and the Goodman Corporation. We really appreciate your support. And of course, our mobility partners, um, which are our, our top supporters for the entire year. Um, we truly appreciate all that you do for us and for, uh, for transportation advocacy. I do wanna invite everybody to ask questions during the program. You can message me directly in the chat box um, and I can ask it for you, but I always prefer that someone else asks the question. Um, so I'm not always the one talking. Not everybody wants to hear me all the time. Um, and uh, we're gonna get started. So I wanna introduce our guest speaker today, um, Representative John Rosenthal, representing House District 135, one of our, uh, our hometown heroes, uh, representing the Cypress um, Jersey Village, uh, Northwest Houston area. Um, he was a freshman uh, representative last session and did receive a recognition as one of the top freshmen new, uh, for, for the session. And so that's, that's uh, not something that comes easily. It was also from a very nonpartisan group, which I think is super cool. Um, also, for those that are our engineers on uh, today, um, he does have a degree in uh, mechanical engineering and has worked for over 25 years as a project manager um, an engineering manager and subsea systems engineer, which just sounds like it, you have to be a lot smarter than I could ever be to, to be able to do that. Um, and um, has worked in and around the oil and gas industry for, for many decades. Um, and he earned a graduate certificate in subsea engineering from the University of Houston. So um, yeah, go Cougs. <laughs> Um, so we got a good mix there of some UT and some UH. So with that, um, I'm going to let Representative Rosenthal take it over and uh, start the program. All right. Thank you so much. We all, always have to get used to unmuting ourselves. Um, so, right. I'm John. Uh, it's, it, I'm so grateful to be here. Thank you for um, having me today. Uh, uh, and for all the kind words, um, folks, a lot people don't know who their own rep is much, much less other people's representatives and state government is so important. And that's how I ended up getting into this. I mean, I was very happy to be a mechanical engineer. And uh, I actually at the time when I when I left industry, I was, you know, I was doing stuff like uh, I was a team lead for um, uh, for the engineering group that did massive subsea projects, you know, in the hundreds of millions of dollars, the biggest project that uh, that I led on was um, half a close to half a billion dollars in scope, and that was just our company's part. So, uh, why does an engineer, you know, making a nice living in oil and gas industry, decide to get into government? It's because um, I felt like things had gone off the rails and. Um, and we needed some sensibility, some pragmatic approach to problem solving. And so that's why I decided to do it. Uh, I am the only mechanical engineer and the only uh, oil and gas technical professional serving in the Texas State Legislature today. So that was true in the 86th session, also true in this session. And I like to think I bring a voice of reason. So um, uh, that's, that's probably enough to say. I don't know if you want me to talk about uh, legislative priorities for this session, or maybe that's how this conversation will unfold. Yeah, sure. I think uh, just kind of how things are feeling right now uh, with session. I know it's been a lot of kind of gaveling in and then doing some formal things and then kind of recessing. And so you can talk about that and some of the issues that are, you think, uh, kind of paramount um, to your work and then kind of just the whole work of, of the body itself. Sure. Here we got a we got a visitor. Come here. Every time I get on Zoom, this little guy here wants to be part of it. So here's Eddie. He's one of our rescue dogs. Very um, sweet. <laughs> uh, I am I am an animal welfare activist, and so uh, I bring legislation to to try to help animal welfare and kill bells that hurt our animals. So 
And just to be clear, he is not currently in the state house with a dog. So, right, we've got the dog around there. <laughs> We don't, and actually, if I was actually on the house floor, I would be wearing a tie. We do right, have a dress code. Right, right. <laughs> but uh, Eddie is an attention monger. My wife literally picked him up off the street in Pasadena a couple of years ago, and he was a stray, he damaged, or you should see the before and after pictures, they're stuck. So, uh, let's go back to business. Uh, this is a weird session. It's a weird time for all of us. We're all being challenged. <laughs> by the, uh, the environment that's caused by this pandemic. And it's, we're also challenged in the state house. And so we, um, we had a very uh, robust debate about the rules to our, for us to operate under. And we've adopted some, some guidelines uh, that are historic, things that measures that have never been taken in the state house, like to protect our safety. We've uh, decided everybody will wear a mask on the house floor until, you know, until the spread of this thing is abated. Um, we have uh, created a facility where legislators can vote uh, kind of remotely. So we can be on the house floor itself uh, or in many adjacent areas. So up in the gallery, if you uh, look in my background, that little uh, area on top, we can be up there or we can be in a room that touches the house floor and we have uh, set up specially secured devices to allow us to take votes and kind of spread out a little bit. So um, members get to operate their offices independently where, uh, uh, so everyone is in charge of their own destiny. A lot of members are taking appointments only virtually. Uh, right now for these first few weeks until we can pick up any substantive legislation, my office is operating virtually. I don't ask staff to be in the building unless it's absolutely required. So um, I'm the one that goes up to take the votes and stuff. And uh, and I expect the tenor of this session, I mean, we, everyone saw the governor's state of the state address last night, but I do think there'll be a huge focus in the session on addressing the pandemic itself and then addressing the economic recovery of the pandemic. And, and I hope to be helpful in both of those regards, I think. I think that's what's in front of us right now. That's, uh, that's what's on everybody's mind. If you're not directly uh, concerned about the illness that goes around, you most certainly are concerned about the economic crisis that uh, has been caused by it. So I think we should be uh, hugely focused on those two areas. And then my personal focus, the things that, that called me to politics in the first place, that has to change. So I got into this because uh, I wanted to be an advocate for public education in Texas. My daddy is a teacher. He taught at the University of Texas at Austin for decades. Uh, he was an endowed professor of position. His parents, where people don't know this about me, folks think I'm pretty liberal. My dad is from uh, rural North Dakota. And so uh, my father was, extreme, was very conservative when I was young. His parents, ran one of those little two-room schoolhouses that's two through 12 uh, with 30 students or something uh, out in the middle of nowhere North Dakota and so I come from an education family my parents and his parents were all educators so that's my first priority has been always will be health care I think we can all agree that that's uh, an issue that's been brought into stark relief right now and then um uh, I was raised in integrated environments and, uh, and equity justice is a concern for me, always has been. And so I'm committed to uh, combat bigotry and discrimination in all forms. And so that's where I come from when I walk into the chamber. Very, very good. Well, I appreciate that. And we, you mentioned the governor's address um, last night. Can you share um, any kind of highlights or, or uh, top items that you feel you're closely aligned with um, or that you think are, you agree that are also, you know, that are priorities for the, for the session? Um, you know, uh, the governor spent the initial part of that address um, expressing gratitude for uh, the people of Texas and, and how we have individuals and groups who have really stepped up in the middle of this pandemic in unreal, difficult situations. Our frontline workers, our nurses, our uh, uh, and besides the healthcare professionals, the safety professionals, the uh, firefighters, the police, and then the essential workers. You know, the the uh, he talked about grocery store clerks and and um, you know and everybody that really has 
help to keep our society moving in a really difficult situation. Uh, he talked about, uh, I'm sure he mentioned the teachers. I'm always uh, uh, in, a, in amazement of teachers, but especially now running the dual path classrooms where they're in person and online. And so I agree with him that the people of Texas are amazing and have stepped up in, uh, in great ways. And um, after that, that speech was very political. And, and I felt like uh, there wasn't not a lot for me to agree with. And uh, I, was, I was live tweeting during it and, and kind of fact checking some of the stuff he was saying. I see. Well, I think um, there's definitely a lot of opportunities to find some common ground. I, I appreciate the, the comment about the gratitude and um, I know we're all kind of trying to find our way through this, but I, and I appreciate the focus on the safety. I'm, you know, I think the, the capital procedures are pretty, um, pretty well uh, honed at this point. Um, I actually had the opportunity to, to, to check it out myself last week and get a COVID test and, um, and see, you know, kind of see kind of the safety protocols that are in place. And so um, I think, I'm, I think it's really great that everybody has kind of come together and tried to, to make a plan at a time when it's been really difficult. I want to talk a little bit about the speaker, um, new speaker of the house. Um, and just, I think the question I like to ask is just the personality that he brings to the house. Um, he gets a lot of accolades for, um, for being able to work across the aisles. And so I'm kind of curious from your, from your vantage point, um, you know, kind of what you, what you're expecting or what kind of personality you think he brings? So it's a great question. And, uh, and a lot of people, uh, and I mean other representatives, don't really know Dade Phelan very well. Mm -hmm. Of course, I was a freshman last time. So my first experience of most of these people was walking in, you know, two years ago in January. Mm -hmm. um, but the last session, I found him not just personable, but um, but taking an intellectual approach, which I, of course, always appreciate, and even in areas where we disagree, we could have, we could have really. Uh, I thought he he was great to debate with and great in conversation. I um, <clears throat> was a huge proponent of his effort that resulted in a massive change to the state structure uh, in terms of disaster preparedness and uh, disaster response, and really uh, of, of coordinated, well-planned and, and beautifully executed effort that included uh, multiple substantive pieces of legislation as well as a constitutional referendum to change the role of, uh, of the Texas Water Development Board and, uh, and fund them for an entirely new purpose, which is a statewide planning and execution organization. And so my first impressions of Dade Phelan were really good, but I'll, I'll tell you the best part is, um, I trust my wife's judgment, which is a really smart thing for any guy to do. <laughs> and uh, she is a remarkably good judge of character right off the bat. Uh, I've never known her to be wrong. Uh, if I ever did, I probably wouldn't say so publicly. <laughs> but but we, we went to meet um, Speaker Phelan at an event that he was holding in Austin. And uh, we came out of there and my wife had a very favorable impression. She said, I really like that guy. I think he's a good man. And so um, I'm going to go with that. I think he is too. And we had a substantial conversation when I met with him just last week or a week and a half ago to discuss committee assignments and, um, and my push to, um, uh, uh, to help revitalize the energy industry in Texas. I think I'm uniquely positioned to do that. And we had a conversation about that. Uh, and also about a law I want to change regarding um, student eligibility. Sometimes students can lose eligibility, uh, academic eligibility due to um, absence from illness. And I had a, a cancer survivor student come and bring the idea for this bill to my office. So we're going to we're going to run that. It's going to be called uh, Riley's Rule. But he talked about his children. He talked about his family. And uh, I just got the sense that he's a good human. He's a good person. That's wonderful. I know. Um... He was, he's making it very intentional to meet with every person, every member of the house um, uh, over the, you know, and he, I think he was at number 60 last week. Or, I mean, he was, I mean, he's really intentional about making sure that he sits with every single member of the house, which I think is, is wonderful. So it sounds like you've had your lots of great uh, time with him and, and you've already got something that you can really put in front of him. And um, I think that's what we, when on our conversations with him, he was very much about letting the members bring, bring the issues to him 
you know, he is not legislating in that way. It's, it's bring me, bring me what you want and what you need and, and, and let's talk about it. So I think that's great. Um, I want to talk, obviously we are transportation advocacy group. So uh, we support uh, funding for transportation. You mentioned that the, the big focus is kind of COVID and recovery. And we feel that transportation funding is one of those things that really goes well with the recovery side, certainly, um, because it's really an investment in the economy and in jobs, right? Job creation. So from your vantage point, can you share um, any transportation priorities or issues that are, that are you know, for you and your, um, and your work that, that really come to the surface as you, as you kind of navigate the session? So there, it's a good question. And, uh, and there are a couple of areas where I think uh, transportation can, uh, can be highlighted for the good of, of the state. Um, not just the economic recovery itself and, and the moving about of people in bits, but access to employment, right? With, uh, with public transportation is a big deal. And, and I um, would love to push for funding for that. Uh, my area lacks public transportation almost entirely. And I'm sure that uh, that would help uh, my particular um, district grow economically. But there's also a very interesting conversation I don't think people think about in terms of transportation, and that's our uh, ports in Texas as part of transportation infrastructure. And uh, I have been, um, I'm very friendly with uh, uh, Chairman Terry Canales, who chair, who last session chaired the Transportation Committee in the Texas House. And he really has, has some very uh, cool, innovative ideas about um, coordinating the effort of our ports and getting more uh, efficient and more productive um, with our port structure in Texas. It's, it's a vital lifeline for not just the economy of our state, but the whole country, right? We, and living where I live, we think about the port of Houston all the time. It's one of the major ports in the country, but we've got ports in Corpus Christi and Port Arthur, uh, home of the speaker, by the way, Beaumont, Port Arthur. Uh, so revitalizing those ports and having them um, operate in a, in a little bit more of a coordinated effort to improve efficiency and productivity, I think is a, is a great effort by Terry Canales. And I hope he'll chair that committee again, because I would love to be part of that. No, agreed. Yeah, he's done a great job. Um, I had an uh, opportunity to interview him for the Texas Transportation Forum, which is going to be uh, next week. Oh my gosh, already, we're already <laughs> well into February. So February 9th and 10th um, and uh, talking about some of the, the things that he learned, um, you know, in becoming chairman of uh, the House Transportation Committee. So I think that a lot of people can agree that he's done a great job. Um, so talking about, um, you mentioned uh, the state, the statewide, uh, the water board um, where you worked with um, Speaker Phelan to get something statewide and get something funded and changed. It reminded me when you were speaking about the Gulf Coast Rail District, which was something that was created, but never funded. And so um, I would encourage, and, and kind of after this conversation too, um, Dr. Lewis, I'm not sure if she's on this morning, um, but she is, the, she is the chair of the Gulf Coast Rail District for, for Houston. And it's something um, that's been uh, needing to be funded for many, many years. And it provides us another opportunity for some of the alternative modes that you're talking about. Um, and it's there, um, it just needs the funding. And so um, I know they're gonna work, they've got some legislation this year that they're working on. Um, most of it is uh, just changing some language so that they have more opportunities to do things. Um, okay, and Carol, she is on. <laughs> Carol, can you add to that um, for Representative Rosenthal? I think it would be great for him to better understand that and you can articulate it much better. <laughs> good morning, good morning, thank you. Uh, hello, Representative Rosenthal, great to see you. Uh, the Gulf Coast Rail District, Andrea has given you a bit of background uh, about the district. And across the years, there have been various initiatives to try to get some seed funding. Right now, our funding just comes directly from all of our member entities. And so what we've got going into the legislature this um, spring is two bills. Uh, one that uh, would allow us to uh, not hold Centerpoint Energy uh, to hold them harmless, 
if we were to allow some of their right of way for some trans public transportation uses. And then the other one is to change our nomenclature to add to our uh, ability to pursue new modes of, of public transportation. So our enabling legislation holds us uh, solely to commuter rail. And so we want to uh, broaden that to add bus rapid transit and other high technologies, even automation that might uh, be coming forth in the future. So those are the two things that we have this spring. Of course, we would love the opportunity to uh, have some way for entities to add uh, to our coffers through perhaps sales tax relief, through you know any of the other mechanisms that we talk about. And then um, not to go too far into it, but there's an area that we've been exploring for uh, transportation reinvestment zones. It's got some opportunities, but some limitations as well. So that's just sort of an overview of where we are. And thank you. I, when, when you said that you were interested in public transportation, of course, that was music to our, my ears. And I know Tom Lambert is on, and we've got Metro next too. And so what we want to do is to, to, to poise ourselves so that we can pursue you know, as much as we can, both inside of Harris County and outside of Harris County so that people who live around here can move freely uh, on public transit as well as in their private autos when we uh, have the opportunity for them to do so. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. And I look forward to learning more about uh, uh, Gulf Coast Rail District. Uh, you all have some interesting subject material. And I went to a couple of Metro Next meetings. So I'm, I'm interested. So definitely keep Keep me in mind, keep me in the loop. Let's, let's see where we can work together. Yeah, we'll make sure we get you some of the information on the legislation that um, that she talked about. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Lewis, appreciate that. Um, so uh, kind of talked a little bit about public transportation, alternative modes. Um, we certainly recognize that we need to find um, for Gulf Coast Red District and other opportunities um, for public transportation. And I think your your comment that it's it's related to access, right? To access to jobs. The other piece is it's quite um, it's access to other things like education and healthcare, um, especially in some in more of our uh, rural communities. Um, and so I know that that's sometimes how we can have that conversation with more rural legislators um, is is talking about. Um, you know, the importance of transit, not necessarily the heavy rail transit that you would see in an urban environment, but also uh, looking at, you know, kind of rural transit as well. Um, so um, I, I thought I lost you for a second, sorry. <laughs> Zoom's throwing all, Zoom, we had some technical difficulties before we jumped on. Zoom is throwing us some curveballs this morning. I think they just wanna keep the virtual meeting platform interesting for us a little longer. Um, so, so with that, I wanna move to, um, our highways, roads, and bridges, right? We can agree that we need uh, multimodal options. We can't pave our way out of a lot of the problems that we have, but certainly these are some of our biggest assets. And so the funding that we do have to maintain them um, and, and build where necessary is also very critical. And so uh, looking at the budget, which came out, the draft budget came out of the Senate, we all breathed a bit of a sigh of relief seeing that there were no cuts made uh, to, to transportation um, but of course, the mechanisms with which we fund transportation are being looked at because they're very heavily tied to oil and gas severance taxes. And so I'm kind of curious, I know you've worked in and around the oil and gas industry, and we've had conversations with the comptroller even saying, does Texas need to look at a different funding model because we, we still do find ourselves very reliant on oil and gas revenue. And so I'm, cur I'm, I'm curious how you uh, look at that and, and your thoughts on that. Uh, it's a it's an excellent question, and um, uh, oil and gas severance taxes is a is a large part of the state revenue, and it funds. You're right; it funds transportation. It it fills up our rainy day fund. So, folks who are familiar with that, you know that money comes from oil and gas. Uh, I keep talking about how um, oil and gas severance taxes funded um, our all day pre K program that I. That was one of the, I feel, one of the great accomplishments of our last session. And so uh, to keep all these things going, um, we're going to have to, uh, in the face of a, of a shifting energy market, we're going to have to broaden and strengthen our revenue stream. So we uh, need to expand those sources of revenue. So oil and gas severance taxes um, are helpful, but 
but we know that um, nothing is forever. And that business model is shifting. And um, even the major uh, uh, energy companies, you know, the oil and gas operators like Exxon and Shell and BP uh, recognize that uh, planetary demand is moving to more renewables and um, we can deregulate them all we want to. It's not gonna help increase planetary demand, right? Um, and so we're gonna have to, to broaden our, our revenue stream for the state of Texas. Uh, it's also, we're gonna have to broaden our industrial base for our employees. You know, I'm part of a group of very senior oil and gas workers, and a lot of us are out of work. Um, like for me, I mean, you mentioned I was a, uh, I was an engineering manager and a project manager for for uh, developing subsea production systems. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, those are very lucrative when oil is eighty or a hundred dollars a barrel. At fifty dollars a barrel, uh, you can't spend that kind of money to get it out of the ground. So. Um, the same, the same mechanisms, the same thing that drives us to diversify and strengthen uh, the energy industry in, in, a, in the midst of a global shift in energy, also it needs to drive us to diversify and strengthen the state's revenue stream. So uh, I think it all goes together. It's part of a larger picture. And um, I'm actually trying to work with some industrial partners to, uh, to forward the concern of um, of broadening our industrial base in the energy sphere. And I think it's particularly important for us here in Houston. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people watching either uh, employed in or around the oil and gas industry. Uh, I have said, I think it's about 30% of our economy and it's because uh, you know, you've got the people drilling for oil and, pr and processing it, but then you've got everything from uh, uh, food service companies to, you know, it, uh, major equipment suppliers, raw material suppliers, uniform, you know, laundry services. There's so much industry that goes with oil and gas and we're gonna have to um, find an industrial base that expands with the times. And so uh, that's gonna have to be where we're looking for revenue for the state also. Right, no, that's that's great. Um, I want to um, talking about revenue and, and how we finance projects. Uh, tolling is just a huge issue uh, that continues to 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 show itself, um, and it will. It, it already has in this session, and some of the bills have been filed. Um, I have uh, Barry Goodman on uh, with Goodman Corporation that wants to ask you a question more specifically about tolling. Barry, how are you, Representative? We appreciate everything you do for Texas. Um, my question about tolling is uh, related to the significant challenge we have in the greater Houston area over our mobility program and how we're going to handle the millions of people that are moving here effectively in the future. And toll roads seem to me uh, to be a, should be a part of that solution. So, that's why I asked the question. I mean, I think there's been a chilling effect on the uh, initiative for toll facilities, uh, but I can't figure out for what good reason. I know that we went to a, a period of time where they were unpopular uh, with the public, uh, maybe through lack of explanation, but uh, with the growth that we have, it seems to end and with the uncertainty of growing revenues from state resources. You mentioned oil and gas, for example. Shouldn't, shouldn't we have a uh, open attitude in terms of adding uh, toll road segments to help achieve our mobility objectives? And with respect to that, mobility impacts more than just the Houston area and your district. It's a multi-county issue and uh, sort of along the lines of Carol Lewis's uh, interest uh, in uh, more flexibility through the Gulf Coast Rail District. Uh, would it be more helpful if we had a multi-county approach to mobility that would involve five or seven counties of the surrounding area working together toward uh, mobility solutions for the future? So good questions. And uh, I'm, I don't, um, one of the things about me is if I don't know much about a topic, 
I'll say, I don't know, or I'm going to have to research that. And the, the topic of toll roads is, is not an area I'm very knowledgeable on. And I, I would rather um, defer that. I, I think it's incumbent upon people like me to, uh, to be open about engaging these conversations, learn everything that we can and make informed decisions. And I'm totally down for that. Uh, be, I also am aware that there are folks who are very positional about toll roads and, um, and I know that there are some uh, probably substantive objections. I'm not, um, I'm not terribly familiar with all of that. Uh, I, I personally like using the toll roads uh, and, and I think as with other problems, there's probably space uh, for all, all modes to, uh, to help contribute to forwarding us and resolving some of these mobility issues. Now, as far as a multi-county approach, I totally agree with that. That was the same argument that I made about um, flood planning. You know, um, uh, floodwaters don't care about your political subdivisions or the letter after your name. Um, they don't care where my district boundaries lie. Uh, and it's the same thing with people who are trying to access work, trying to get um, to and from services, you know, like, uh, like Andrea was saying, healthcare and stuff like that. I've been trying to work with the public library system here to develop a library program for underprivileged students. Also, um, another there's another set of initiatives to do job training for uh, for kids who are in the later stages of high school, for the ones that want to go into vocational vocations. A lot of them don't have transportation, so how do they even get to the training to qualify for the jobs where they can afford to buy a car, right? So um, I, I think a multi uh, a county approach, a regional approach is very sensible. You know, I live right here on, uh, right, my district borders uh, Houston proper. We're unincorporated Harris County, so I've got city of Houston nearby, but we aren't technically that, although my address is city of Houston. And I've got Copperfield, I've got Cypress, uh, Katie is in my district, you know, and I'm right next to Waller County. So, you know, if we're not taking a regional approach, then we're going to leave everybody on the borders out. And, uh, and that just doesn't make any sense mm -hmm. to me at all. It yeah, I appreciate to... very much your answer on that. I think you're right, spot on. And if you, uh, if you need any further information or data about transportation mobility and all of that, I'm sure Andrea and half the people on the on this call can uh, help fill you in. Uh, but it, I was, it occurred to me, uh, and I know that we've got maybe Tom Lambert on the line and some others that in looking at public transportation from a regional perspective, there's no way right now for someone in Galveston to get to Houston by the bus. Right. And so those are, those are things that we need to work on to resolve. And part of it is a funding issue. Uh, part of it is uh, that, um, I think uh, a couple of counties I work with uh, in, uh, in the Houston, greater Houston area, uh, if they had the opportunity, would like to vote to increase local revenues to support mobility, whether it's through the registration fees or otherwise. And I think um, we've asked uh, many of your associates uh, as to whether they think that uh, legislatively enabling a local option to vote locally to increase certain revenue resources is an acceptable approach. Uh, we've sort of gotten a 50-50 mm -hmm. response to that. And I know this legislature is a difficult one to introduce things like this, but you know, we, we also have the next legislature, legislative session. So I uh, just wanted to throw these things out on the table and not take up too much more of everybody's time, but I appreciate everything you're trying to do for Houston. Well, thanks, thanks, Barry, and very thoughtful words. And really, there may be space in this legislature to, um, let's hope, to deliver some, uh, uh, some autonomy, uh, restore some of the local control to our uh, municipalities because uh, the move away from that, I think, does a disservice to, um, to constituents. You know, there's, a, there's a, a large block of 
um, of governance that I think works better if it's closest to the constituents. You know, so where your you can access your city council members, your um, uh, commissioners, your county commissioners, you know, and your your local elected representatives and people like me. Um, and we keep saying Texas is a big place. It's not a one size fits all. There are no one size fits all solutions for the 254 counties in Texas. And so that's why local control over many of these issues is so important. Yes, but thank you, uh, Barry and Representative Rosenthal. That was a great exchange. And I think a lot of this is just making sure that we have these conversations and we keep bringing the issues forward um, because at some point we know that with the, everything that we're doing now is not gonna work forever. And so it's really great to keep these ideas flowing. And I know for TAG, our agenda, our legislative agenda um, really focuses on tolls being a, just an item in the toolbox. And you never wanna take an item out of your toolbox, right? You wanna always have all the tools at your fingertips that you might need. Um, and and it's, it's never gonna be good for everybody, but I think we're also, we've been fortunate that our model for tolling in the Houston area is not like other models of tolling in other parts of the state. And so it works for us great, might not work well for North Texas or other parts of Texas. And so um, again, it's not a one size fits all, right? We can't just take it out completely. So I appreciate that conversation. And then with conversations about the sales tax and, and lifting that cap, at the state level just to enable localities, not a mandate, right? But just to enable localities to make the decision for themselves um, uh, to tax themselves for something very specific. You know, you've, research shows that when you have a very itemized list of things that something is going to go to, whether it's a tax or a fee, you have much more, um, much more support. And so I think that's the goal is that eventually we would be able to, to very specifically allot um, some type of local revenue source to um, other modes of transportation. So great, great conversations. I, I definitely agree with that. And, uh, you know, we do, we have elections for bond referendums for our, uh, for funding schools. And it's kind of a similar thing. People get to vote on whether their money should be used for this or that. I think it's a way to, to bring the decision straight to the people. So right. I definitely agree with you about that. Thank you. I see that Michelle has his hand up. I always appreciate when someone raises their hand. <laughs> Good morning. Um, just uh, just to reiterate on uh, the, the, the pre previous speakers and uh, and to add a little bit to it, I don't know if we if we did, did a good job or not by letting you know the research out there that says every dollar we put in transportation we get we get three to six dollars back as far as economic development and and Angie has got can 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 point you to a, a, a few sources just to kind of show that. So back to the tools in the toolbox. Yes, this is one of the tools of the toolbox. And if, we, it, it's, if we're gonna use that for, for transportation, then it's really like not only double whammy, it's a triple whammy, right? Because people are not the, we're not taxing people to build the road and yet we're building ro the road and employing people and doing uh, a business uh, a development uh, on top of that. So we just would like to, to keep that as a tool. We're not saying, you know, use it all the time. If it works for that particular situation, uh, if it works for us as a region, we would love to have it. Uh, so your help would be appreciated on that. Very good. And uh, appealing to my studio side is a, is a really good way to, to get my favor. <laughs> You know, uh, I love to see studies um, and really the dollars and the cents. And I and I am very interested in investing in our future, investing in our society. And when we can show things like this, uh, pay dividends on return, it's it's more than just a dollars and cents conversation. It's about doing what's right for the people. And uh, if we better the state and our economic revenue picture in the process, that's just a bonus. I feel the same way about job training, right? We um, invest in job training and I've got a bill to uh, put extra money into job training veterans who are, are coming off of service and their uh, tra training and skills in the military may not map to the most popular trades and, and uh, vocations available to them right now. And it's been shown, just like you're saying, there's a massive return. It's not two to one, it's like five to one or six to one, every dollar that we spend um, 
brings revenue to the state and it benefits our citizens and our society. So I'm, I'm down for making um, prudent investments and I'd love to see the research. Thank you, Michelle. And we will go ahead and send you um, a couple of the items that we've talked today. Um, we'll definitely send that over to, um, to your staff. Your staff has been wonderful. Um, so we will get that to you. Uh, I wanna talk about talking about revenue and trying to find different sources of revenue. While it's not a large source at this point, um, there's been a lot of conversation and we really led the conversation last session on alternatively fueled vehicles. And the fact that um, that's an industry, that's a, that's a revenue source that's a potential, potential revenue source that is growing. Um, the industry, the automobile industry is starting to only manufacture uh, electric vehicles, hybrid vehicles, right? Um, the challenge with that is that we find ourselves realizing that, that then they're not contributing to the gas tax, right? So great for the environment, moving forward, technology, but how do we capture that? They're still using the infrastructure. And so the conversation has been, um, how do we assess a fee? It really is an equity conversation. Um, and you'll hear Chairman Canales talk about it in the context of, there's, there's a lot of other equity issues to look at. So trucking, the trucking industry and the weight of the trucks. And so if we're gonna look at alternative fuel vehicles, we have to look at everything. Um, but there's just a general consensus that we need to really start looking at equity when it comes to using infrastructure and, and, and paying for it. So can you share your thoughts on, on that, that policy? Because there's legislation that's already been filed and uh, there's more coming on that issue. So you'll definitely have a chance to weigh in there are definitely going to be opportunities for a conversation on this subject. And I, uh, I do anticipate some spirited debate along these lines, right? Um, but I also agree that uh, we cannot just keep um, clipping off our traditional revenue streams and expect to be able to operate as usual unless we shift that, um, that supply, that revenue to uh, other sources. And while you're right, um, the alternatively fueled vehicles thing is going to be an issue. It's not. It's not going to be the hugest piece of revenue for the state, but every every part is important. And uh, I I do want to make a point out of major automobile manufacturers are already saying you're not going to be able to buy an internal combustion engine from us after X date. Volkswagen has already been on this curve, and they their date is 2025. You know, so that is. Four years away, you're not going to be able to buy an internal combustion engine from Volkswagen. Right. Uh, Elon Musk is moving into Texas, right? We're all happy about the industrial base shifting into here. Uh, that's going to be a big draw, and there's going to be some jobs and some revenue based off of the industry. But then we're going to flood our roads with electric vehicles that are not using oil and gas in the same way. So you're right. We need to have some conversations about how that's going to work. Um, I'm, I'm going to be open to hearing all the sides on this, but it, it, it's got to be both parts for me. We got to do what's right for people of Texas. We have to do what makes sense from a pragmatic point of view. And so there, there needs to be both aspects, what's right and what works. And those two things, um, I believe, can always, we can always find a marriage there. Right. I pre we appreciate that. Um, I think, uh, you know, we are looking at the legislation. I know Representative Ken King has filed, I think it's House Bill 427. Um, and it's similar to the one that he filed last session. Um, and then I know that Senator Schwartner is going to be filing something in the Senate, um, perhaps alongside Chairman Nichols. And then I, I know Chairman Canales is looking at um, an omnibus bill, which has a lot of things in it that would address uh, the equity conversation. So just stay tuned on that. And we will definitely continue the conversation um, with you and your staff and anything that we can provide um, you know, for you as far as information. So I'm gonna check and see, I think we've got. Um, so I, go ahead. Uh, and, I, and I love to do it. I mean, that's, that's what engineers do. You know, I research stuff and I try to learn as much as I can to make um, decisions and in, in foreign policies. And I used to do the same thing building equipment and designing systems and system philosophies. So the more info you can send me, the, the happier I'll be burying me with that. And uh, and maybe I can walk in and make some, you know, reasonable uh, informed decisions. Yes, we, we appreciate that. I, I got a few, a few comments. This is a topic that a lot of people like to talk about. Um, so Esmeralda, who uh, is 
as our manager of operations at TAG, um, she was doing some research or just knows this maybe, but she said GM is on its way to an all electric future with a commitment to 30 new global electric vehicles by 2025. So I think that says a lot in follow up to your conversation about Volkswagen. Um, so thank you, Esmeralda, for that. Um, I have Janice Burke on with the Sports Authority. Janice, did you want to ask your question directly? I'd love to give you that opportunity. Um, sure. Here, let me turn my, my uh, camera on here. Um, so um, at the Sports Authority, we do the sports marketing for the um, region, and we are currently talking to Formula E, which is, uh, would be like a Grand Prix with electric cars. Uh, and if we can, you know, make all of the, the things work and the requirements, I wonder if there might be a way with this group or in line with this conversation to use some of the proceeds for something important to this group. Yeah. Yeah. I love, I love the idea of an electric vehicle Grand Prix. That sounds like so much fun. I bet it's we kind of, yeah, it's kind of a neat way to get, um, People thinking about alternative, right? You know, measure, you know, transportation. It's something that's fun and creative for young people to have an interest. Um, so it's just something we've been kind of um, bouncing around, but just wanted to mention it because maybe there is a way to do something good with the proceeds of it. I, I yes, absolutely, Janice. We can talk more offline, and I appreciate you um, bringing that. That's that's great. We're all very, we're clearly all very excited. So we're all, <laughs> you have immediate audience. <laughs> So thank Very you. Cool. Very cool. So many, so many people love auto racing. And, and nobody knows this about me, but uh, I prefer to drive a standard transmission vehicle. And I think I, I, it's, it's how I learned. Um, I'm an engineer. I'm a gearhead. I'm into the engines and the motors and all that stuff. And so I'm really curious about how we're going to get uh, more horses out of electric engines. And, and um, I'm looking. Looking forward to seeing some electric hot rods, you know, are, are we going to have them, you know, are we getting up torque to burn rubber and, and grind gears and stuff like that? That would be so much fun. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Janice. Um, so I, I want to uh, ask a question that's also a very heavy related to transportation, but crosses a lot of other uh, sectors and, and issues and that's safety. Um, we know that uh, Texas has the campaign and the streak Texas. Uh, we've not seen a day without deaths on our Texas roads um, for over 20 years now. Um, that's not insignificant. And we thought that we would see a dip during the pandemic because there were less, road, less cars on the road, but we found that things like speed and distracted driving still, um, I think yesterday, um, I, I, speaking with uh, Mark Williams at TxDOT said that they're poised to have, they're still getting in the data, but they're poised to say that 2020 might be the worst year yet for fatalities on Texas roads. And so, um, there's a lot of things that we can do to change that um, and to help influence uh, driver behavior um, with some policies. And one of them is reducing speed limits in, in more residential um, and even urban areas where uh, the roads are just not meant to be driven at, the, at, the, at, at 35, right? The difference between a 25 mile per hour and a 35 mile per hour is the difference between an injury and a fatality. And so I know Representative Silly Israel, who is a huge transportation advocate and we've had her on many times and she'll be on again in a couple of weeks. Um, one of her big priorities is this issue. And so um, I just wanted to get your thoughts on, on that topic, specifically with regards to um, ensuring that our speed limits are appropriate for, for safety in, in residential and urban areas. Well, I'm, I'm in favor. So, and, uh, and I signed on to uh, Representative Celia Israel's bill last time. Um, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a family guy. And although my kids are adults now, you know, I live in a neighborhood where kids are on the street playing and you are not going to get where you're going any faster by speeding through my little neighborhood or any little, you know, resident. I think we, I think you froze for a second. I'm gonna wait. Is everybody else seeing the frozen screen? Yes. yes. Okay. Okay. You know, it's, it's, is it me or is it? <laughs> I'm never sure. So I, uh, let's see here. There we go. In industry, okay. I, I, yeah, in industry, I was a safety trainer. And uh, 
And I got into that because safety is such an important issue. We need to value, you know, our fellow humans and especially our kids, you know, playing on the streets and neighborhoods. So um, definitely, even if your neighbor, I don't care who you are, if your neighborhood has a speed limit over 30, you don't need to drive that fast in a residential neighborhood. You don't get anything out of it and you're putting your neighbors at risk. Right, and I think too for um, like for the city of Houston, I know it's an issue on many of our, our city roads um, where um, it helps to have the state level uh, legislation because then the signs can be placed that say 25 miles per hour and it's not on the burden of the municipality um, to have to make those decisions and do that. It's, it's so it's, it's an enforce, it's an enforcement issue. Um, it's just, it is, it makes it much, but actually in this case, we're asking, we're asking the state to come in and say, <laughs> please do this, you know, for us. Um, and so. Well, our, our represent already do that. I mean, the neighborhood I'm sitting in, our posted speed limit in this neighborhood is 20 miles an hour. And Jersey Village is an important constituency and their posted speed limit is 25. So uh, a lot of these residential areas already see the value in that. Right, right. Um, well, we look forward to that. And then in our conversations with um, Representative Israel will definitely um, keep you all in the loop. And I think I think Representative Bray Lopez has some safety stuff related to pedestrian safety um, as well as um, bicycle uh, safety. And he is another huge transportation, um, just a, a great uh, portal of information. So. Um, a new desk mate. Oh, okay. Well, there you we, go. We had some shifting, and and now, um, and now on in this next legislative session, Ray Lopez and I sit next to each other on the House floor. There you so. go. He is a wealth of transportation information, and we had him on, um, I guess, in the fall, and so we'll try to reach him again. So you can just kind of elbow bump, right? Is that the official handshake now? Um, Give him an elbow bump. <laughs> really good guy. He's a he's a very thoughtful and intelligent guy. Yes, good, yes. Good addition to the house. Yes. Yeah, so speaking of thoughtful and intelligent guys, I'm going to bring on our our chairman, uh, Mustafa Tamiz. I know uh, he was able to join us, and so I think he would like to offer a comment, maybe a question. Mustafa. Hey, hey! Thank you for that great introduction. Look at that. <laughs> uh, the board has to meet and, and give Andrea a raise. That's fabulous. Look, uh, th thank you, uh, uh, the Representative. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and I was listening in on the conversation and 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 just flipped my camera on just to say hello. Uh, it's good to see my friend Janice Burke here uh, talking about racing. I, I'm also a gearhead, uh, but in a different way. Uh, th th thank you for for everything that you're doing. I have a question as, as you as you start the, the legislative session. I know that the House assignment uh, or, or committee assignments are happening uh, fairly soon. Um, we, you know, the Texas House has always been a moderating force where Democrats and Republicans come together. You have Democratic uh, committee chairs. Uh, how will you be and others be dealing with the Senate? to kind of bring that moderating force in the Senate as well. Has there been any conversations that you've had with other senators in our region or even around the state? Um, I, it's a good question and I wish I had a better answer. So I do know that a couple of our house colleagues um, have just joined the Senate. And we had a Democrat and Cesar Blanco uh, win in the El Paso area. Um, Carol Alvarado, in, in a couple yeah, of sessions. Yeah, Carol Alvarado in the previous session and uh, and also now Drew Springer. And uh, and so I feel like that actually gives me personally more access than the Senate because I have very good relations relationships with, with all of them, including some of the more um, conservative members, you know, like Drew Springer. He and I were exchanging te texts all over the interim over all sorts of things from policy stuff, pandemic stuff, family stuff. So I'm really looking forward to working with them. Now, as, as far as moderating the Senate, you know, uh, I, I probably shouldn't be too um, politically incorrect, but, but dude, the president of the Senate just ran through a motion to uh, negate the democratic gain there and take away their, their voice in, in, uh, in the ability to vote on what, um, what, bills will be brought to the Senate floor for debate. So uh, we're, we're gonna have to really work hard to, um, to negotiate with them, to moderate some of the, some of the uh, more 
out there voices. And I think that the same goes for us in the house. You know, we have a couple of new members who seem to be um, bomb throwers. <laughs> so, uh, but I think that it's encouraging that some of the, um, some of the traditional uh, uh, conservatives in the house were outspoken about some of these more inflammatory um, motions brought by the uh, some of the new sort of uh, fringe um, uh, uh, members, and so I like to think that this is this is going to be a good deliberative session for the house, and hopefully, you know, as a group, we can influence what goes on back and forth with the Senate. And I hope that the speaker is reasonably moderate. He seems like a pretty good yeah. guy. Yeah. And uh, and he seems to be open to having reasonable um, uh, conversations, even on topics where we disagree. So I'm always optimistic. You know, you got to be realistic, but uh, we can we can push for the best, the best that we can. And it's good to see you, Mustafa. It's good to see you, my friend. Good to see you. Thanks. Thank you. And Andrea, back to you. Well, thank you um, so much. Uh, I want to remind everybody some of the names that were mentioned. Um, we do have um, uh, Representative uh, Julie Jones this Friday um, that we'll be listening to Representative Lena Ortega on February 19th. Um, and we've got Representative Ed Thompson on February 12th um, and Senator Kel Seliger on February 16th as well as a whole host of others. And you mentioned uh, Cesar Blanco who is a member of Senate Transportation on his first time in the Senate. So that's fabulous. And we're working to get him scheduled as well. Um, and we will have um, Senator Alvarado on February 23rd. So um, please uh, Representative Rosenthal, we look forward to staying in touch with you. Please come back and, and tune into some of these and you can haggle some of your, you know, your colleagues and associates in the House and the Senate. Um, we have a few that get on and do that. So that's always it's always fun, um, but thank you so much for your time and your thoughtful answers today. Um, it was such a joy and we look forward to staying in touch with you and anything that you need from us, uh, please let us know. Thank you, it's been a, it's always a real pleasure to be able to have, you know, open, substantive, thoughtful conversations and, and you can definitely count on me. I would love to come back um, and, and, and maybe heckle some of my colleagues, I'm down for that. <laughs> And then, okay, so I have one personal thing I'm going to ask you. And if it's if I if I'm if I offend you, then Mustafa, you can take away that raise option off the table. But I'm watching you, and you remind me of Robin Williams. And I'm wondering if you've ever gotten that before in your life, the actor uh, Robin Williams. I, I haven't. So you have I'm not. Sure. You have your disposition reminds me, and maybe it's just because I just watched the original Jumanji not that long ago, but. <laughs> But you are you are very uh, you're very jovial and you're very kind and it, it it you can it reminds me you remind me of your mannerisms remind me of him so I think that's a good thing I think that's a good thing. <laughs> and, uh, and, and Although I'm not easily offended, that's the sort of thing that would never offend me anyway. Very but good. Uh, uh, taking a positive approach is important to me. Yes. Yes. A great smile. Yes, that's I think that's what it is. I think it's the it's a Robin Williams smile. So. Ask your wife. You you trust her. Ask her. See what she says. You you mentioned that earlier that you trust everything. So <laughs> we'll follow up. <laughs> Thank you all for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing everybody on Friday with Representative Julie Jones. Take care, Representative Rosenthal. Thank you so much. Thank you, first of all, to TAG for all that you're doing. And thank you for thinking about those families we need. I hope to see y'all soon. I appreciate your work, your advocacy, not just during the session, but post-session. You're innovators, visionaries, and I, I really appreciate that. Appreciate the friendships that I've, that I've had with the transportation uh, community. Thank y'all for putting these on. It's just a really great idea. And thank you to everyone that's watching. Definitely thank you to TAG for keeping us connected, continuing to keep us connected even in these unprecedented times. Uh, we're all in this together. We will come out of this together. We will definitely be stronger together.